Hello, everyone. Good morning. A very good turnout for the first session of the, of the day. Welcome to the Trident stage. We're going to be having a little bit of fun here, a little bit of energy going. And I am going to be your MC today. My name is Masha Healy, and I'm really excited to uh, learn alongside with you guys today. So our first talk is going to be Kendall Cole, who is the director and co-founder of Proximity Labs. Kendall co-founded Proximity Labs, a research and development firm focused on the NEAR ecosystem. Formerly at Consensus and the NEAR Foundation, Kendall has a deep Web3 po product and business development experience. Kendall leads strategy and outreach for NEAR's DeFi and scalability solutions. Let's hear what you have to say, Kendall. Give this a second and see if we can load these slides. Uh, where is my? All right, one second. Here we go. Okay, now we should be good. All right, hey everyone, my name is Kendall, uh, and I'm going to talk to you guys about how you can build cross-chain applications without using bridges, which we think is gonna be a pretty important pattern for this, uh, this next wave of uh, the market cycle. Uh, so this probably isn't a surprise to any of you who are, who are already using DeFi, but cross-chain DeFi is becoming increasingly important uh, pretty much every single day. So here's a chart that I found pretty interesting, which is that since November, we've seen bri daily bridge volumes uh, more than 4x. Um, and we've also seen cross-chain swap volumes see a similar kind of peak in interest. And it looks like this is only going to continue as we have more and more chains, layer twos, and other kind of layers that are launching, which seems like pretty much hourly right now. Um, one of the problems we have, though, is that bridges have a lot of limitations. Uh, they, one, they are really difficult to build securely. Uh, just a few of the headlines from the last couple of years that show some of actually really high quality teams and high quality bridges that have suffered exploits. Um, and a lot of times this is actually just because the attack surface of a bridge is quite large. They're really difficult to build. The other issue is that there are no bridges that support anywhere close to every single chain or layer. Even some of the more prolific bridges like Wormhole, which have done a great job of integrating a lot of chains, do not support nearly every single chain that's out there. Um, and some chains they can't support, like non-smart contract chains, including Bitcoin and others. So what this means is that if you want to bridge across multiple chains, most likely you're going to have to use several different bridges, and each bridge has a completely different user experience. Uh, you might notice that bridges have very different speeds. Some are you know, minutes, some are hours, some are days or even weeks. You also might notice that when you bridge an asset uh, to a chain, you'll realize that you actually ended up with the wrong version of the asset. A lot of bridges use kind of a wrapping, unwrapping pattern. And what this means is that you may end up with a certain type of wrapped USDT and go try to deposit that into uh, a lending protocol or swap that somewhere and realize actually that you have a version that is either unsupported or does not have very much liquidity, which creates a pretty <laughs> frustrating problem for you to then solve and figure out how to get the right asset. Um, and then last but not least, Bridges oftentimes do not provide you uh, a great way to acquire the gas tokens of the chain that you are using. Uh, some of them are, are starting to add this into their protocol and it is, it is helping, but you likely will still end up in a situation where you'll have to find a way to acquire the gas token uh, for the chain you're trying to use, even if you manage to bridge, say, a stable coin or another asset. 
And again, every single bridge is going to be different. And so users have to basically learn how to use several different bridges, which is not ideal. Fortunately, we actually do think that there is a new design pattern that is going to alleviate a lot of these challenges. And basically, this is what we call programmable MPC. So a lot of you might be familiar with uh, MPC type of wallets. If you've ever used uh, Coinbase Wallet, supports this. Uh, if you've used institutional grade solutions such as Fireblocks, they support this. But these are actually really designed for uh, kind of the user having, their, having one of the keys and then a centralized party having one of the keys. With programmable MPC, we can actually allow developers to kind of tap into these solutions as well. And we can also make them decentralized. So what are some of the key advantages of decentralized programmable MPC? Well, they, support, they can support any chain, including non-smart contract chains. So with this programmable MPC, you can support Bitcoin, you can support Ripple, you can support Dogecoin, you can support any chain. Uh, and you also get instant support for new chains. As the MPC kind of provider, what you do have to support is the different types of the different elliptic curves. So you need ECDSA for the EVM chains, Bitcoin, and, and a lot of Cosmos chains. And you need EDDSA for Solana, Near, Cardano, and others. But if you have those primitives, then you can support any new chain as soon as it launches without having to go and integrate that chain like most of the bridge providers have to. And then last but not least, you can provide a much more standardized user and developer experience because you can essentially have a, a simple API for developers to build on top of. Um, they might still have to themselves integrate a new chain, but they'll be targeting a specific community anyway. And then users, when they go use this solution, they won't have to you know, wait different amounts of times for bridging. They won't have to uh, potentially even deal with gas tokens depending on the implementation. It can just be a lot more consistent and normalized for the user, which uh, we think can lead to you know, a true potential for something like chain abstraction, where the user doesn't even have to know which chain they're on. So there are several teams that are building uh, programmable MPC today. Uh, I think just about eight total, and probably a couple that I missed here. Uh, fortunately, some, some very good ones. Uh, and there's two kind of main patterns that are arising. So the most common is what I call deposit-based. And this is typically where uh, essentially like the programmable MPC network will maintain a single or a small number of deposit addresses that can basically be used to create kind of a canonical bridged asset. So good examples of this, Definity with their chain key, they have kind of uh, Definity Bitcoin, Definity Ethereum. Uh, Zeta Chain recently launched, is being getting a lot of attention. They support Bitcoin and are going to be supporting more. They basically have this kind of main deposit address. Some of the more uh, unique ones, Chainflip and Thor, and Thorchain is kind of the OG here. Uh, they use this for like swap-based addresses, where like the, the kind of nodes will give you an address to deposit your Bitcoin or Ethereum to, uh, and then they'll allow you to trade essentially that asset with another user. And then Axelar is building kind of more of a generalized bridge solution, but still has this very deposit base, like they maintain one address uh, for you rather than letting you have access to the address yourself. So uh, near protocol, uh, which is what we're working on, and then lit protocol use a little bit of a different pattern that I would call account-based. And what's cool about the account-based is it actually lets an end user maintain sub-accounts for any number of blockchains. Uh, so the example uh, from what we're building in near is we actually let this near account, which can also be a smart contract, and that opens up a lot of a lot of really cool avenues, can essentially request a through through uh, a smart contract or even through like kind of a native near action can request that the validate the near validators or the, the MPC nodes sign uh, an arbitrary payload, which will likely be a transaction for Bitcoin, for Ethereum, for OP, for uh, Atom, whatever it might be. Um, and then what they'll get back is they'll get back that signed payload, which they can then relay to the chain. And a lot of this will be abstracted away, and the user will just think they're signing normal transactions that'll end up on the Bitcoin chain, that'll end up on you know, whatever destination chain they have. Uh, for developers, what's nice about this is the API is actually quite simple. It's basically going to be the sign function. They pass in the payload. They can also pass in kind of a key derivation path, which means that like every single near account can have essentially like a very high number, sort of infinite number of accounts they can sign for on any given chain. So a near account could have, say, 100 uh, accounts on Bitcoin, or a smart contract that's using this in a more flexible way might have tens of thousands of uh, accounts that they're maintaining on Bitcoin or on Ethereum or on these different chains. And then you can, of course, pass in the key type. And this is basically like how the, the only thing you really have to do to differentiate between chains is like make sure you're using ECDSA for ECDSA supported chains, make sure you're using ED25519 for those chains, et cetera. 
So to visualize a little bit of what this process looks like, so we have the near account. The near account initiates the signature, which goes to these MPC signing nodes. Then these MPC signing nodes basically sign this payload, and then they'll essentially help route this transaction to a destination chain, which can be you know, several. Uh, we're also building a gas relayer on top of this, which is a similar type of path. The big difference here is that you'll have relayers who will essentially pick up using like a gas router contract. These relayers will basically pick up the transaction. Uh, the user will pay them in something like USDC. Recently, we had a, a demo from the Sweatcoin team who had their users paying in sweat to then send a transaction on Binance. Uh, and then this relayer will basically take your payment, send you BNB on your BNB address or Ethereum address, whatever it is, and then also will route your signed transaction. And a lot of times this can happen in the same block, and so it creates like a really smooth experience. And this actually enables what like wallets, uh, uh, application layer teams, end users to not have to deal with multiple gas tokens and multiple chains. They can actually live in a world where they can use USDC to pay for gas on transactions on any chain, uh, which we think is pretty pretty cool. So what are some of the other use cases? Well, we're particularly excited about what, uh, what can happen when it's a smart contract that's using this, uh, this, these chain signatures. So I think there's three in particular that I'm excited about, uh, in addition to a couple of others that will eventually blow minds. First is bridgeless cross-chain DeFi, hence the name of this talk, and we'll go into a little bit more detail there. Uh, the second is DeFi on non-smart contract chains. So you can basically uh, take chains that really only support transfers, like a Bitcoin, like a Doge, uh, like a bit tensor. Um, and what you can do is you can use near smart contracts to act as escrow contracts and also kind of manage who controls what. And on top of just this fairly simple primitive, you can build lending protocols that support any asset on any chain, including assets that are staked or in kind of unique states, maybe even in liquidity pools. It's very flexible. Uh, and you can also then, of course, build swaps. And you can actually power swaps between any asset on any chain. So you could be trading like a staked TIA for an NFT on Solana. It can get really wacky. Uh, and then the third that we'll touch on a little bit is you know, what we were just discussing, which is that multi-chain account abstraction pattern, which includes support for a gas relayer. So one of the things that's cool about near accounts is they're natively smart contract accounts, meaning that like any near account can have any number of keys. And so you can rotate keys, which can add for security. You can have kind of multi-signer patterns. It's very flexible. Um, and you get that out of the box. And you can then use that as your account to sign for any chain, uh, which I think is pretty cool. So to dive a little bit deeper on some of the ideas that we're seeing teams explore in the bridgeless cross-chain DeFi realm. So we talked about the native swap. So we talked about the cross-chain lending order book. You can even power something like restaking for any asset on any chain. And you can basically handle kind of the slashing conditions and the reward conditions on near, which is going to open up a lot of opportunities uh, and, and just ways to reuse assets. Uh, and then we'll walk through this example kind of specifically. But uh, you can also build a Bitcoin ordinals marketplace that's quite trustless. So to dive a bit deeper into that example, let's imagine that we have a seller of an ordinal. We have a buyer who wants to pay, say, USDC in this case, for that ordinal. And then in the middle, we're going to have this near smart contract that's going to act as kind of the marketplace contract. So the way this will work first is the seller will basically ask the marketplace contract for a deposit address on Bitcoin. What's going to be unique about this Bitcoin account is that only the marketplace contract can request from the MPC signers the ability to send a transaction on behalf of this account. Uh, and what it'll do within the, the smart contract state is it'll basically recognize that the seller is the owner of this account. And thus, that seller can, act, can like request to, say, withdraw or move their ordinal out of that account, as long as it's not in an active order. On the other side, let's say that the buyer deposits USDC. This user will deposit the ordinal finally. Um, and then if they decide to list this ordinal and they have an open order, the contract will not allow them to withdraw. And this is basically just so that the buyer who kind of comes in here and buys this doesn't have to worry about something happening on the Bitcoin blockchain uh, kind of behind their back. Only this marketplace contract can, can uh, allow a withdrawal. And they will only allow a withdrawal if the order isn't open. So order is now open. No withdrawal is allowed. Uh, let's say they list it for 10 USDC. On the other side, we have a buyer who will accept this listing. They say, cool, 10 USDC works for me for this ordinal. So here's where something really cool happens. So what we said before is that this seller was the only one who could re request the withdrawal for the ordinal. So because this trade has now been executed, 
What will happen within one block, so atomically, is that the buyer will now be the only one who can request to withdraw this ordinal. So they effectively now control this ordinal. They can withdraw it to an account they control and exchange whatever they want to do. Then on the other side, the seller now is in control of that USDC. They can also withdraw it from the contract, uh, go do what they want with it. And now we have uh, this completed atomic transaction. So this, this pattern talks about an asset on NIR and an asset on Bitcoin. But again, this can be generalized to any asset on any chain. Uh, in that case, basically what will happen is the marketplace contract will only be doing one thing. It'll essentially allow, uh, it, it'll just be verifying that two users have agreed to swap their accounts. That's all it'll do. And like two things, it, it, it'll like let users basically list their account for sale uh, and that account can basically be controlling assets on any chain. And then uh, when both users, like the seller of the account and the buyer, basically si have co-signed uh, essentially an order, then it'll decide, okay, cool, now we can basically swap control of these accounts. So it'll actually be completely agnostic to what assets are being listed on what chain. And, and that flexibility is what allows this contract to then support any asset on any chain, which we think is pretty exciting. So uh, we just launched the docs for this protocol. Uh, we have uh, a test stable test net that is up that you can try out today. So if you check out the, uh, the QR code on the left, you can see those developer docs and try those examples. Mainnet coming soon. Uh, and then on the right side, you can join the developer Telegram chat, where we have all the devs who are building this and a lot of project uh, people building different projects. And, and we can answer any questions that you might have or brainstorm on ideas or uh, you know, whatever it is that might help you on your way. And that is it. Excited to see what everyone can build with this technology. Uh, and yeah, happy to chat with anyone you know, after this who's interested in programmable MPC or has any questions. Thanks, everyone. All right, everyone, we're going to have a, a nice little five minute break. And then next we will be hearing about ERC 20, the open cross chain token standard.